The assignment is actually to um, to design some kind of building, but um, in such a way that the, the process is kind of um, uh, um, turned around. Turned around. Process. What kind yeah, of process? The, what do you mean by process? The design process. We have to start with the structure before knowing anything about the surroundings or other parameters. So we really have to start with a pure structural um, systems that we. Mm -hmm. could use. But structure not in, in, in the way of, of construction, so not nothing about um, mm -hmm. the, the, the material, but um, rather um, a sort of um, architectonic uh, hier uh, hierarchy, hierarchy, hierarchy mm -hmm. uh, in, in the building um, of, of um, um, the, the, the following of rooms mm -hmm. uh, that have certain um, sizes. Mm -hmm. So it's more in, in that kind of way than, um, than construction. So the structure mm -hmm. is some kind of... Structure is a hierarchy of, of, of spaces or rooms yeah. yes. which are sequenced in a certain way. What is yeah. that hierarchy? Could you say? Um, well, it, it can be um, it can be a, a hierarchy in, in rooms, that, uh, rooms that are in relation with the human. So you, you have rooms we know that the, the building is, is going to be um, used by people, um, <laughs> probably. <laughs> so we that's the only thing we know about the rooms, that there will be uh, people in it. So that can be some kind of um, link or starting point to form the, the spaces. Um, but it's also some kind of, um, we think, some kind of um, form. So we have to design a, a form that we think is, 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 is good for um, is, is good for adaption to some kind of place mm -hmm. so when we get the other um, the other information about the program and the place mm -hmm. it's, it, the, the structure has to be very adaptable mm -hmm. so you have to mm -hmm. transform or, or um, mm -hmm. yeah, transform the, the structure into that sort mm -hmm. of this is fascinating. yes. There are a couple of things. Is it okay to respond now? Yeah, yeah. Sure. Maybe you can tell me more about your aims. First of all, I, I, have, I have a friend. I have not just one friend. I have friends, but one of, <laughs> let's say one of my friends. She's called Alice Foxley. She's a landscape architect. And she photographs, one of her passions is photographing French fortifications. Uh, designed by a particular architect, I forget his name, and these are uh, they're ideal structures, and they're, just, they're like machines, they're designed to defend and to uh, project, uh, to send out projectiles uh, for defense when, when being attacked. And she said that, so there's an ideal kind of mechanical form that, that works in that sense. And, but whenever you take that form, that plan, that's generic plan, uh, it always has to have, it's always adapted, it's never simply built as planned. And so there's a, the form, there's the place itself where the form meets, but there's this adaptive uh, layer. And so you could understand your um, plan, your generic model, as having an element beyond itself, which is this adaptive element. And that's the unknown, of course. And that only comes into being once you uh, take your generic form or ideal form and apply it to the place itself. That's one way of structuring it. So in other words, it's beyond your... Uh, you have three layers then, let's say. It's, you described to me the first... Well, the first layer is the place itself, which you don't yet know, presumably, or maybe you know it, but you're not using that as a as a, as a reference or as a, as a, as a 
initial idea for the development of your design. You have your ideal form or generic form, which can be applied anywhere, presumably, based on the structure of a series of rooms. And then there could be this third element. That's one way of, 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 uh, that I could imagine you, 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 you think about it. I'm not sure if you want to do that. What do you think about that idea? Um, yes, it, it, in, in certain ways, it's one way to, to start with the structure. Um, we, we haven't had really much time to think about because we're uh, doing this right now. So the, the assignment hasn't yet started. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's, it's, um, it's important to, to maybe look at um, at other buildings mm. and think about um, mm. how they uh, how they started or how they um, became later um, through time maybe um, destroyed and what is still left there. Mm. So, well, for example, so I, re I mentioned the uh, fortifications. That's one example. What examples do you have in mind when, when you? Well, in our assignment, they also um, mentioned the word intelligent ruin, um, which. Is, well, we interpret it as um, a building that is built for some purpose and then the purpose changed and the building was adapted to that purpose. So um, the structure, of course, has to be adap adaptable. Yes. So um, that's, that's something to start with. Maybe yes. we could look at purpose yeah. changes in, yeah. in buildings or... Um, uh. Also, typologies, maybe, okay. um, types of buildings. Yeah. So, so, sorry to interrupt, yeah. I keep interrupting <laughs> you both, I'm sorry, but an idea comes to mind, a clarification. So what I just suggested, this, this uh, photography passion of Alice Foxley, the plan is, um, when is that plan adapted? In, and then we'll go, I'll, I'll go to, to, to what you just said. I imagine that the plan is adapted I'm wondering, it's not a question, is the plan adapted when the designer knows that this ideal plan is going to fit at a certain place? Is it already adapted then? I think it is. And there might be also be a moment that in carrying out uh, the building works of the, this example, the fortification, uh, further adaptation of the plan is necessary until the, the very last stone is built. Um, I think why it's a good, ex a good example uh, is that it's quite extreme because on the one hand you have something built very solidly out of stone and stone isn't the most uh, adaptable of materials but it de and that's my that's my second thought at what uh, all life and things built are adapted continuously anything living and lived in and of is continually under transformation. It depends on what time, the temporal scale of things, how you understand transformation. And there's the immediate transformation of this. This is moving. But if we look at this beautiful cathedral, uh, it too is undergoing transformation. And we do all we can to resist uh, its transformation. And now, maybe in 300 years, we might think very differently about it. We don't know. And cities are always undergoing transformation. These edifices, these stone structures, they're moving, dancing, even. They're dancing. So, uh, but it's a very, for us, it's a very slow dance. And for a hummingbird, it's, it's even slower. A hummingbird that has a heartbeat of, I don't know how many, Per second. So, um, it's another th then there's a third thought. It's a question of perception. How do we perceive uh, 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 transformation uh, around us? So, um, so I think a third thought is um, when you mention rooms, the structure you want to suggest or put forward is a sequence or a collection of, 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 of rooms. Now, a room is a very architectonic element. A room is, is uh, 
when you think of ruin, I think of like, rooms and buildings. But what happens if we were to understand ruin not in the sense of an old stone structure which, into which we introduce temp more temporary wooden elements which lend themselves more to change or more a quicker pace of change because I've already s said that also stone changes but it's more so slow. What happens if we say that um, all traces all traces are ruins. That actually the whole city, these stone structures, are simply a trace which we leave behind us for the next generation, for your great grandchildren and beyond. It's they're simply traces, sometimes more solid, sometimes really fleeting. For instance, the dust that you move when you walk across this the, the dusty floor. It's also a kind of ruin. So that's what I'm. So so let's go back to the notion of, of this. Uh, uh, the question of, of uh, rooms. What happens if you were to understand to take away traditional architectonic classifications or known words for uh, uh, spaces and introduce the notion of of movement or trace? traces of movement. So there's a, uh, a thinker called Tim Ingold who says that actually we don't perceive our environment, in, well we can, but we tend not to perceive our environment as bounded space, walls, rooms, corridors, streets, but actually we perceive our environment as a series of paths behind which we leave traces. And for me, this is a very liberating thought, also for your project, because it, it lends itself more to an understanding of our environment in terms of the temporal scales, temporal orders, time, how things, at what pace things change. And whenever you talk about ruin, it's of the highest order of questioning uh, how long does it take to, to become a ruin and the materiality of things you know, if they lend themselves to change or not. Um, are you... So, <laughs> I don't know if I'm making sense, but what I mean is it might be... It could be important to understand, first of all, what you mean by ruin, and, and to let go of room as the structuring element of, of your project. It could be another kind of... a structure based on another kind of, uh, of element. So, you are... You, you take the um, the urban element of a city, so a city is constantly moving, and there are al always people moving in the city, and that element you take into your building to form your rooms. Well, that, that's just exactly that's just part of it. <laughs> um, uh, so what I what I to use the language of Tim Ingold, there, it's best not to use the language of city countryside. You know, that's, what we have is simply, uh, I tend to use the language of inhabitation. This place is more inhabited than the countryside. If you go ask a farmer, does anybody live here? Yeah, sure they do. Cows, animals, and me too, the farmer, my family. But if you live in the city, no, it's empty. Countryside's empty. But it's, it's not, it's full. It's full of living life, life. Um, so, I'm very aware of the words that I use to describe things. So, for instance, I tend not to use the word city, I tend to use uh, the inhabited landscape, which is more densely inhabited. But, but inhabitation, then, is not, for me, clarified or defined by walls and rooms. It's actually a question of the meeting of paths. How often and when are these knots of people's lives, when do they when do they occur? So the city becomes, a, a, in a sense, a crystallization of the vessel through which it facilitates knottings. Uh, I'm not sure if buildings are very good vessels for this to happen. They are, but they don't seem to have changed very much. 
a notion of what a, a, a vessel for that facilitates knotting, let's say. We tend to see, uh, and sometimes they seem to be bad, uh, uh, binding, uh, enclosing, so bounding us in the sense of enclosing, rather than uh, uh, facilitating knots and meetings and paths along which our lives are led. Um, I don't know why that is. It's security, fear, social structures. Uh, we, so also maybe because people who go into the building are filtered. It's only a certain kind of people that visit that building. Yeah, yeah. So it's these kinds of structures, these social structures that you might, rather than rooms, let's say, that might become the beginnings of yeah of structuring your project, mm -hmm. let's say. Or an investigation into how we meet, and, and not just how and where we meet, but when. I would privilege the when above the where, which I think you're already suggesting because you don't want to put it in a place, but you might want to put it in a time. I think that's what I'm suggesting. Yeah, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> So you, you, because we um, yesterday we had um, Philip Hirtz here mm -hmm. sitting, and he was talking about um, the difference, uh, the the strong difference in, in structure when you build in a city because you have very um, you you have a lot of uh, conditions in the city. Mm -hmm. they're, uh, they're mostly a, a help to your mm -hmm. uh, to designing a, mm -hmm. a, a building, but he um, he think it, he thinks it's it's more interesting. Um, to build um, in a place um, at a countryside where there's um, um, well, not less but less visible uh, conditions. Thank you for saying that qualification. <laughs> not less but less visible. Yes. Um, and well, he, he mentioned the, the the very strong difference between those two structures and how you. Um, or contexts or structures. You mean structures or context? Structures in different contexts. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so um, I was wondering if we have to build a structure that we don't know yet where it's located. It can be in a city or it can be at a deserted place. Um, in, in which way does the because you talk about pets and maybe the um, the movements of people in the city reflects in a building maybe. Um, but if you don't know yet the place, how, in, in which way does the, the movement of the, of the people um, mm. reflect in that building? Mm. A thought. A thought. And a thought only. Um, not a conclusion at all. Not tested. That you simply, you try by doing. You don't know beforehand. You simply do something and then learn from it and then adapt what you've done to take the next step. Learning by doing, sorry. So I, I think I'm suggesting design something, make something generic. It could be quite dumb even. Something. It doesn't have to have perhaps much meaning in itself. <coughs> something simple. Maybe you even build it. It's that simple. Yeah. Maybe you even build it one-to-one. -one. Take it and put it in what you're calling the city. Densely inhabited. Not place where knots happen. Not where a knot. Take the same model and see how what happens. How you then have to adapt it. Take the same model and put it, what you're calling the countryside, a place of many knots, less visible knots, because we privilege human uh, values for us, a love of ourselves, rather than a, a love for all things, uh, living things and non-living things. Put it in that place, see what happens, how you should then adapt it, uh, rather than trying to plan it beforehand. That's a thought. I'm not, I'm not particularly sure of myself 
if that's a good thought or if that would work, but at least it might help you to ask some more, take the next step to ask another series of questions, uh, or maybe to answer, reflect, reflect intelligently or clearly, sorry, to reflect clearly on, on the questions you're asking. Um, I, if you know, if it's in in a densely, all places are densely inhabited, but it depends what you privilege. If you privilege humans above ants, <laughs> and why do we do that? I think it's time to address that because it's not doing us every, everything and ourselves much good to think otherwise. But that's another, I think that's another question. <laughs> um, yeah. So there's quite a bit there. What is ruin? You know, think of it in terms of choice. And, um, uh, another way to do it is simply not to design a Let's say I use the word dumb. Perhaps it's not a, a very good word. Uh, a neutral object, but uh, if you do use this other language or way of seeing things, if you do adopt it or test it, you could simply start to map what's already there in one place and then another. And then start to, uh, but then you've done. You're doing what you don't want to do. You want, why is it that you want to do what you're doing without a place? Why? Yeah. That's the assignment. <laughs> I is, think it's it's sorry. No, it's, go on. Um, I think it's worth the, the the research just to just to look at what would people design when they don't know anything of the place, um, maybe just the size of the, of the building, mm -hmm. that's the only thing you know. I think it's, it's very interesting to, to see how everybody um, puts things of, of themselves in, into this, some, kind of, um, some, some kind of form or yeah. um, maybe, um, and it can come from um, um, uh, buildings you have seen before or you like, but maybe also some kind of experience you you had with um, with rooms. So people who are afraid of big rooms. Um, so some kind of things. Um, oh, we love big rooms. Of we love big rooms or, or open spaces. Um, those elements will come forth when you when, yeah. you, when you design. So, but in a way, uh, we do this anyway. We do this all the time. We're projecting. You could say that everything you, uh, all this, you invent. All this conversation, you're inventing. So are you. And each one of us, there's something very shared here, but there's also something which is simply a projection. And um, whether you like it or not, uh, you, when you want to be neutral, when you want to not take the context into account, as you say, you have you will your your experiences in your your I should go further than that because we're not just a summary of all of our experiences. I should think that we we project all that's around us. And uh, it will always be different according to who is uh, is is uh, receiving it. <laughs> Which opens it up of course. But I don't know if that helps you, that reflection. I mean, it simply means that one person will see it differently than another, the same thing, if it's an intervention design or just a place that's already there. You'll do it anyway, I believe. But what are you going to, what's the next step of your project? What's going to happen? Well, I'm wondering if you, as she said, as you said, um, want to put so much of yourself into the structure because you don't have any other 
that's what I used to put in. How can you put something like that into a structure if you don't even know the purpose of the structure? If there's no program. Yeah. You don't have to program either. I think that's wonderful. Okay. <laughs> to work without a program is great. But to work without a program and without a context very hard. Because let's talk about that for a minute and then let's move on to. Uh, I don't know how long we've got, but anyway. As long as you want. Okay. <laughs> let's talk about that for a minute and then move on to, let's say, uh, beyond that. Uh, there's a, a, a very wonderful man called Sebastien Marot. He's a, a thinker of landscapes and architecture. And he, say, and he says, he'll quote for the vault, very uh, summarily, uh, concisely, in, uh, in Europe, there, there have been two main uh, ways of, of uh, understanding uh, architecture. The main progenitor of the one has been Rem Kohlhaas, the main progenitor of the other, there hasn't really been one, perhaps a landscape architect called, whose name I forget, Serge Cham, 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 Chamatov, some, something like that, something like that. My apologies <laughs> to Serge. And um, the, the first is where you take the program, and, and only the program more or less, and you start to manipulate the program, play with it, and the, you're almost con doesn't matter where this program lands, and you uh, you come to a building. This is essentially the way of Kohlhaas, super modernism, whatever the, the, the Park Lotzman called it, which is, might be a peculiarly Dutch phenomenon. But, yeah. this, this, the second, <laughs> the second Sebastian Maro talks about is. Um, where the architect or designer plays a much more reticent role, not at the forefront. And the role of the designer or architect is simply to read the context, read the place, and draw out of that place uh, the design, almost as if that building already exists, but you simply call it up through your reading. Of course, I, I like to belong, I like to think that I belong to the second of these traditions that have taken place over the last... 20, 30 years. But I actually believe there's a th there could, but you're asking for a third. You're going beyond both of these. No program, no place. And that's why I'm fascinated by this question. And actually, let's also talk to Sebastian Moreau about this. He's the man we should also talk to. Uh, he's now in, uh, in the States. <laughs> All Paris. So, yeah, e email him absolutely with a very, very clear um, question. I'll, I'll give you his email. I'll, I'm sure he wouldn't mind giving you <laughs> me giving you his email. So, what I'm asking myself: What then is, is the third way beyond these two? Um, There was a lecture by Anna Holt Holtrop on uh, Monday. Yeah. And uh, he's working with a Chance. So he's had a study trip in Japan. And he, uh, was, I think he's fascinated by the Japanese ink drawings, although he never made direct reference to them, where the artist throws uh, ink from the end of his paintbrush onto the paper. And he sees, or she says, where it lands. And then out of this, you elaborate a painting, you draw a painting. I think this is wonderful. It's without context, it's without aim or program, let's say. It's simply you let chance speak. I think this, and Anna describes this as it opens up all, all possibilities, all possibilities are good. There is no, why should it be this or this or this? Nobody's going, well, there is no reason it seems why you should, it could be this why it could not be this or this or this um, however the, now I was thinking 
Anna, I, I agree with you, Anna, completely. This is a really good way to work. Let chance uh, have a role in, in the way we uh, design as architects. Artists have been, are ahead of us. Uh, there have been, I wish I could, uh, yeah, Jackson Pollock, I'd say, is the most obvious one and well known. But there are many artists who are dealing with chance in the work. Over the last 50, 60, 70 years, perhaps. Um, however, to go back to your question or your project of ruin, because you mentioned ruin, whereas Anna's project is, and my reflection with the uh, generic plan of the, ide the ideal uh, fortification, that's rather like. I think the way Anna tends to work is working is that he uses his uh, the chance element in the design in the designing of to come to uh, a, a fixed plan and after it's been fixed uh, based on that chance element it stays fixed and chance no longer plays a role in the further transformation of that building it's fixed so it's like a, it's like a fort it's like an edifice like the building's rooms. However, what I anticipate is our buildings, and I think this is perhaps where you might be heading, I'm not sure, I anticipate the design of buildings or buildings in which the design continually plays a role. It, you make a building and then it's remade and remade, but that could happen quite quickly. In the past, it used to happen outside the lives of single architects. It might be knocked down after 200 years, uh, and then another somebody else would come along and build something else. So we're talking about temporal orders here. There's an acceleration of transformation. So the transformation could happen within the lives of one designer. How fast is that change taking place? I'm suggesting it might take place in buildings every month or every year. So, the, so in other words, every month you get a new ruin, or a ruin, a ruin which something left, which something which is no longer used in the same way, let's say, and that happens. So, in other words, chance and chance could inform the decision of the, the design of, by the architect on a on a on a regular or a non-regular basis, but on a on a quick, in a quick way. You see what I'm suggesting? Yeah, yeah. I think it was a really good example uh, from the Japanese painting. Yeah. The, yeah. The system of work. Yes, and it's like, oh, and it's it, for me, it's very inspiring because it is not a system. It's not a method. Method, I think, belongs to science. It's a kind of, I'd like, it's even magic that you let chance speak, and from these dots, you can draw out. It ins at that moment, you th somehow your pen or your hand draws tree, or draws animal, or building. And I'm fascinated by the subconscious that is there in the way we design it. We suppress it. We're supposed to be logical and, and uh, scientific. Even scientists are realizing that they're also subjective. That, uh, the results of what they see are high, dependent upon what they want to see. So these kinds of pressures start to start arising. So that's one. So to, to recap, that's one way of going beyond thinking with, with if there's no program, if there's no context. What then could another way of designing be? could be like the way of Anna, which I think why Anna is getting a lot of absolutely, he's really on where it's at for me right now. Yet, it misses a dimension that actually in the end you create an edifice which is fixed. And I don't see that as our future. I see a future of uh, changing structures, changing according to changing circumstances. Yeah. Yes. Which we call adaptability, we, but it's more than simply adaptability. It's a, stru a changing according to changing circumstances is a, is a definition actually of what we used to call vernacular. 
vernacular became a style, so I'm not talking about style. I'm talking very much about, uh, I know <laughs> old buildings, the way we used to build and inhabit, let's say, is a, a very good model of this, an old farmhouse with uh, outbound extensions every generation or something. It's a very dull model, but it's a very practical model of, of something which is uh, which changes for changes circumstances. Most buildings are, you know. This building is a great model uh, example as well. I think that is uh, an important element in our assignment to think about that change through uh, for the future, mm -hmm. I guess. But um, I also wanted to say that uh, Anna. Um, I had it a bit difficult with this. I think their these projects are really uh, well. They're great, but I was kind of uh, not surprised by, but rather. Um, yes. Yeah, I don't know how I felt about it. Dead <laughs> to I don't know really how I felt about it, but I thought it was a bit. Um, there is n shallow. N no. No, a bit. Um, there was not really a, some kind of story. I think when you when you build something, especially um, when you know the place, you have to. The concept is rather a, a story. I yes, guess. to have a feeling about the place. Yeah. and um, I think Anna just he felt like uh, drawing some kind of. That's right, right? Yeah, yeah. He, he felt like it's drawing, quite random. Yeah, it's, it appears very random. And I don't know how that is translated in real architecture because and that is where the the discussion of uh, architecture as an art starts mm -hmm. so the the responsibility that architects have yeah. i don't i don't because i i thought about it when i saw um Merce cunningham the the, 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 the chore choreographer yeah he he works a lot with chance but right thank and, you um but i i guess it, when you when you um, create a dance, it's um, I think it's it's uh, it's great to use the the, the element of the mm -hmm. chance. But I had a problem. Well, not really a problem, but I, I just thought about it. When you use that element of the chance of, of some mm -hmm. kind of um, coincidence mm -hmm. in, in architecture, it becomes uh, less responsible, I guess, because yes. It's, because uh, a, a dance, you perform the dance for an hour or whatever, and then you go away, and every and then it's there. It's happened. It's done. It's not there for a long time. When you build a building, it's influencing a lot of many many people through the years. Okay, so in the last few years, I've been looking at uh, dance, um, and I even call the dance. Of, of, uh, of the environment. It depends if you, if you, how you see the environment changing. If we, if we can, if we say that um, our built environment is, is, trans is changing very quickly, at what moment? Where does? Uh, where? And imagine that increases the way our environment changes. Speed, let's say which our environments change. Could you imagine a moment when that meets? Imagine the dances of Merce Cunningham are extended not from an hour, but to a day, and slowed down. And let's, let's say that day transforms to a week. And a building is only there for a year. Imagine that actually, at a certain moment, they begin to meet. When, and let's say they do meet. Could then you understand architect? Could you then give architecture the freedom of expression, of temporality that Merce Cunningham gives his uh, art? So in that way, and Anna, I think meets with the dancing, but that also proves that what he's making is not, I think, uh, architecture because it's more, and he thinks not. I think it's he's more uh, an artist then because he, he only um, builds uh, temporary uh, structures. Well, actually, his last project.
is was in the, uh, in the museum. Yeah, in the fort. It's interesting. We're back to the fort again. Yeah. Uh, he won a competition. I mean, he's building yeah. uh, a, a gallery, uh, a museum in a fort. It's a very, it's, 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 it's a building. It's, it has a courtyard. It has rooms. It has walls. Even. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the question I had, Anna. And I didn't even ask him afterwards at dinner. Was what? Um, how did you come to the form? And because it's clear that uh, it's, it's more installation pieces. He came to the form by uh, uh, by lines, which he drew like doodling, whilst on the telephone, let's say, uh, on a piece of paper. But at a certain moment, there was a map, which he said, "This is what I think the ground would do." when it became soft, buoyant. Uh, that was actually the starting point, or the, 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 that fixed actually, or determined that uh, the form of the plan of the building, because he then took the contours, the, the Hochdelainer of this buoyant form, and translated it into walls and a courtyard. So I wasn't sure, that was the, I wasn't sure about and he said that was the most difficult drawing to make. But I wish I'd probed him further and asked him, what, how, on what basis did you make that drawing? Was it on a basis of chance? And I'm not sure it was. But anyway, that's to do with, to do, it's asking how do you use chance? So we're getting away from the, the most cunning of all, which I think is a very relevant one for you. Uh, you know, I also don't, uh, I embrace the possibility that architecture and art is an, architecture is an art, and, and I really like. I really anticipate uh, much more that we give ourselves the freedom that immerse dancers and painters and, and Bill Viola and all, 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 all the artists and John Cage give themselves. That's what we can really do. Uh, so, does that mean we keep on building cities, though? Well, I, Streets and rooms? Yeah. Perhaps not. <laughs> so, you know, I think, you know what it, it could be? Okay, to think very practically now about your project. Could be that you introduce the element of chance as a generative, as the beginning of your design, and you simply make a form, or, yeah? and then you apply it to one place, and you apply the same form to another place, and then you see what happens, how they, what what adaptations could, and you take place, and then you're talking about scenarios. And this is another thing. So we take the language of dance. Of scenarios of narratives which are a given expression of sequenced uh, stories I could imagine you think in terms of scenarios in other words no master plan no final plan uh, no non-deterministic approach where you take uh, different scenarios and each, and each one and you test each one, and you then you then you talk in terms of likelihoods, possibilities, but not in terms of it would so. This has to be like this, otherwise it's not going to work. We have the, the information that the place is going to be uh, on the Aran so it's going to be in the, the harbour region. So. The harbour region. Yeah. Oh, so you do have a place, yeah, well, but later on in the region, we just have the whole region, but it's. But I, ah. I think it's better that we didn't know it yet. Yeah, I think so. Okay. <laughs> yeah? yeah? Does this give you food for thought? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. I wish I could give you an answer, but <laughs> it's not the point. No. It's simply no, it's enough to, to it's, think to think. It's a lot of inspiration. Yeah. yeah. No, there is not really an answer to No, that. no.
Good luck. Thank you. Thank you for the. Will you will you show me the results in some yeah. shape or form? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'll give you my email. Yeah. Okay, and the other email to the friend. Sebastian. Yeah, right. He's he's very ambitious. He's very serious. So please so write a very good again? good email to him. What did he do again? He's a he's a French philosopher on architecture and landscape, and he set up uh, a series a publication called Le Visiteur. Uh, in the late 80s, 90s, and he wrote extensively about uh, J.B. Jackson, John Brinkhoff Jackson, who's a great thinker of landscapes. All the great thinkers of, lands land of landscapes are becoming much more relevant to architecture. Okay. He was I, I, I'll, I'll say this and then I'll shut up and go away. Sorry, what? Uh, he's, he was the one who took all the information from the surrounding context and JB JB Jackson uh, uh, spent his life reading the American landscape and translating it, uh, and giving a series of lectures of these readings, readings as as, as a way of understanding the environment, uh, basically translating what is seen into uh, uh, to uh, and sharing it with others. He made a very good distinction, J.B. Jackson, between the political landscape and the inhabited landscape. And the political landscape is marked by clearly defined boundaries, and the inhabited landscape and is created and by architects, by planners, by politicians. The city. The inhabited landscape it evolves slowly over time. It's full of shifts and transformation and vague boundaries. I think this is the thing and ruins often. This is the landscape you're talking about. J.B. Jackson says these landscapes always exist together, but there's ac more accent given on one than the other. So please read his book, his essay, A Pair of Ideal Landscapes. It's, it has great clarification in it about your, our environment. Uh, there was one other quote, then I wanted to shut up, <laughs> but it's gone. It's okay. Then it's time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. And I thought they were going to interview me. <laughs> nice tactic. Yeah. <laughs> yes. uh, uh, my, my belief is that in architecture, we'll. Um, yeah, that's too much. <laughs> For the architect, the most, the greatest lessons can be learned from understanding the landscape. Now, the landscape, uh, of course, the landscape is simply the environment, the built environment. But the way, uh, perhaps, the discipline or, or understanding of the landscape, we can learn as architects, because what the landscape has often that the architecture doesn't have is it has the growth element of vegetal things so you have the mineral masonry walls coming together with the, with the vegetal and the vegetal is growth there's trees soil ecosystems and studying landscapes i think is, is one way to uh, for architects to become more engaged with their environment that's, that's another reason, perhaps, to go out of the city. But actually, your site is in the harbour. So. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because I, I, I always thought that landscaping was some kind of decoration. In, yeah, well, another part of architecture that that will that is more important when you design in, in a very uh, vegetal area. But not, I think the city is really interesting. Yeah. And I thought, well, landscaping is. Uh, in the city, it's not that important, I, I think, but it's more like the, the, yeah. the city itself. Yeah. Um, but as you as you say it now, it, it mm. sounds really so. It sounds yeah. it sounds well architecture. Yeah, so. yeah. And if you're um, having something to do with the water, think about what water is. Think about the possibilities of uh, of building with water, or on water, or in water. And are there, are there any fish there? Um, not really. It's, it's really? surrounded by dogs. So. Dogs? 
Ducks. 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 No. Yeah. Ducks. Like for ships. Yeah. Oh, dogs. Ah, dogs. Dogs. Ah. <laughs> ducks. <laughs> ducks. Ducks. Dogs. Ducks. Ducks. Dogs. And dogs. Ducks. Okay. Dogs. Oh, so that, on that note, on that bombshell, I think we should, uh, we should end it. <laughs> Thank you very okay. much.